Robert Putnam wrote the book Bowling Alone 15 years ago to alert us to the decline of bonding social interactions in the form of bowling leagues, civic organizations, to participation in our shared public life. These voluntary associations, he argued, create valuable social capital that in turn enriches and strengthens our lives in community. His particular turn, concern at the time that he was writing was that many of these organizations were in serious decline, including, hence the title, bowling leagues. Here's one story that he tells about the value of the social capital that's created by one such league. Before October 29th, 1997, John Lambert and Andy Boschma knew each other only through their local bowling league in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Lambert, a 64-year-old retired employee of the University of Michigan Hospital, had been on a kidney transplant waiting list for three years when Boschma, a 33-year-old accountant, learned casually of Lambert's need and unexpectedly approached him and offered to donate one of his own kidneys. Andy saw something in me that others didn't, said Lambert. When we were in the hospital, Andy said to me, John, I really like you and have a lot of respect for you. I wouldn't hesitate to do this all over again. I got choked up. Boschman returned the feeling. I obviously feel a kinship with Lambert. I learned about him before, but now I'm really rooting for him. This moving story speaks for itself. But the photograph that accompanied the report in the Ann Arbor News reveals that in addition to their difference in profession and generation, Boschma is white and Lambert is African American. That they bowled together made all the difference. In small ways like this, and in larger ways too, we Americans need to reconnect with one another. That's the simple argument of this book. But bowling leagues were in decline, as Putnam wrote, and the decline continues, according to a recent report in the Leisure e-newsletter. That's not to say no one is bowling, as Putnam makes clear, but bowling has become a casual activity of families and acquaintances who already know one another for other reasons, as opposed to a place where people meet and get to know one another across lines of class race and age, as happens in bowling leagues. Nor is the decline of bowling leagues the only example of voluntary associations whose decline is troubling. Putnam gives examples of the decline and dissolution of bridge clubs, chapters of the NAACP, VFW posts, charity leagues, alumni groups, rotary clubs, and many others. And these trends, of course, have been continuing since he wrote. There was an article in last Sunday's New York Times Key Magazine, the Style Magazine, by Molly Young that asked in its headline, is staying in the new going out? She describes the decline of weekend socializing in New York City. She quotes some word paintings from a series by the novelist and artist Douglas Coupland called Slogans for the 21st Century, including your sense of community is now someone you visit at 11.30 on a website. And it's probably for the best that everyone is online instead of being outside wrecking things. The resources at our fingertips that are now available for electronic interaction and the endless array of entertainment opportunities that we have available can be just too compelling as an alternative to the risks entailed in going out, according to Ms. Young. Putnam and Young point to the many pressures of work, the alternative private leisure time activities, and much busier lives for parents as among the reasons for the decline of civic life. Those ties that bind our communities across race and political lines. And I would argue that the decline of such voluntary associations is also one of the factors behind our more recent political polarization. And as other observers have pointed out, citizens are increasingly segregating themselves into communities that are relatively homogeneous by income, 
education and class, one of the results of which is the best schools and homes are available only to those with relatively high incomes. One result, as Peter Morales, president of our Unitarian Universalist Association, points out in the thought for contemplation this morning, is that just under half of all Americans in a 2004 survey now have either no one or at most one person with whom they can share personal information. Level of loneliness we have not experienced before in this country. Hence the critical importance of our congregation, bound as we are by covenant to one another, and of course so many other congregations. Because the truth is, we need one another. Actually, that's your line. Try it out. We need one another. When we mourn and would be comforted. We need one another. When we're in trouble and afraid. We need one another. So we greet our new members joyfully because... We need one another. And the particular genius of our Unitarian Universalist congregations is that we recognize that our need for one another doesn't require that we believe the same things, that we recite a common creed which, creed which may comfort us, but may also offend our conscience and our integrity. As our, unitari as our universalist forebears put it several hundred years ago so eloquently, we need not think alike to love alike. And we're bound here at First Parish by our covenant to dwell together in peace, to speak the truth in love, and to help one another. Sam Baumgarten, our president, has put up signs around the parish hall to remind us to live into our covenant all the time. Thus, for example, living our covenant, keeping an open mind. Living our covenant, be true to yourself, maintain personal integrity, honesty, authenticity, confidentiality, and listening sensitively and patiently. And we are bound together by our seven Unitarian Universalist principles, which I highlight the first and the last today, the, those to affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person and respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. We think especially of our seventh principle today in anticipation of Earth Day this coming Friday. Our Earth needs our care and attention. And for this, your line, when we would embody our respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part, we need one another to continue the good work of embodying our commitment to being a green sanctuary and of doing all that we can as a community to reduce our impact on the Earth. We will find ways to power our church and many of our homes using only renewable energy. And we continue to engage in public witness to remind others that we all need to make and support changes and sacrifices to save our children and grandchildren from the ravages of climate changes that we humans are causing by our profligate ways. Our first principal project here at First Parish is one of the important ways that we live out promoting the inherent worth and dignity of every person. A number of us gathered the last two Thursday nights with our friends at Messiah Baptist in Brockton to discuss the book Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. It's his account of working for justice and dignity, serving as a lawyer to inmates on death row and among young people who were incarcerated for life for offenses they committed as juveniles. We'll be working together with Messiah and several other local Unitarian Universalist congregations in this area to deepen our commitment to standing against the scourge of mass incarceration, which has devastated communities of color around our nation, including our neighbors in Brockton. In the spirit of our Read to Me program and other volunteer work that folks do at the Old Colony Correctional Center, we're going to be hosting a workshop on mass incarceration here at First Parish next September 23rd as part of our celebration of the 300th anniversary of our congregation. And we're about to commence a discussion about becoming a Black Lives Matter congregation. The thing is that to do this kind of vital work in our community, your line, 
We need one another. We need this beloved community of memory and hope. We need to have friends and companions as we travel through life and work to live into our own highest aspirations. When we mourn and would be comforted. When we are in trouble and afraid. When we are in despair and temptation and need to be recalled to our best selves again. When we would accomplish some great purpose and cannot do it alone. In the hour of success, when we look to someone to share our triumph. In the hour of defeat, when with encouragement we might endure and stand again. When we come to die and would have gentle hands prepare us for the journey. All our lives we are in need and others are in need of us. May we live into this reality and into the fullness of our lives by living into our covenant together. We need one another to shine a light around us in our communities. We started our time at Messiah last Thursday night by reminding ourselves of the light that needs shining all around us. This little light of mine. This little light of mine. I'm 